you see my slides okay? Yes, it all looks good. Thank you. Perfect. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to go outside of my community to talk about my work. So first of all, thanks Neil and Deirdre for organizing this and for inviting me. Uh, I should also mention that uh, I'm honored to be talking alongside Dr. Margaret Mitchell today. I mean, I'm sure you all know, but her work is foundational to this field. And in fact, as you'll see, one of the main things that I'm going to talk about today was directly inspired by uh, a project that she led. Um, all right, so I'll be talking about a paper that I worked on with Professor Arvind Narayanan at Princeton University. Um, it's called Leakage and the Reproducibility Crisis in ML-Based Science. So let's start off rather unconventionally by a question for the audience. So what I'd like you all to do after I have sort of explained the question is to quickly hop into the Zoom chat uh, with a yes or no answer to the question that I have, have for you. So the question is this. Can machine learning models distinguish a wolf from a dog? Um, here's what I mean. So given that you have enough images of wolves, like the one on the left, and given that you have enough images of dogs, like the one on the right, do you think a machine learning model, consider the state of the art machine learning model, do you think it would be able to uh, distinguish between these two species? Just a yes or no answer in the chat, please. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I'm seeing a majority of the yeses, though I do still see uh, like some no's splattered in between. The answer is indeed uh, yes. Like given enough images of wolves like the one on the left and like dogs sitting on the grass, um, you would indeed be able to build an ML model which can distinguish between these two species. But here's where things get a bit more tricky. So what happens if we flip the background? The wolf is no longer on an icy field and the dog is no longer on a grassy field. In fact, the backgrounds have been completely switched. So this is something that machine learning models struggle with quite a bit. It's not so easy anymore for the model, which is trained on data like the one we saw before, to distinguish between wolves and dogs in this case. The reason is that machine learning models rely only on correlations. So if you have wolves in white backgrounds and dogs in green backgrounds, the machine learning model can still continue to predict which one is a wolf and dog as long as you do not change the background. But once the background is flipped, it is anyone's guess how well the model does. Um, so this has been called shortcut learning. Uh, machine learning models rely on shortcuts in order to learn patterns from data. And it turns out that they're great at detecting the background, but they're not so great at detecting species. Perhaps most importantly, there are no good ways to control for the confounding effect of background when we are using ML models. So it's not very simple for us to recognize when these issues can occur when we're using machine learning. Um, this is an example of what I'm going to call leakage throughout the presentation, and we'll get to the definition in a minute. But while this example might seem a bit silly, perhaps, um, like the stakes are pretty low in a wolf versus dog classification setting, Imagine if this happens in a much higher stakes situation. So we could have the FDA, for instance, approve snake oil because people believe that they found a magical cure using AI, but there could be like a confounding factor in that case as well in the use of these uh, algorithms. All right, so zooming out for a second, here are three goals that I want uh, to sort of go away with at the end of this talk. So my first goal is to convince you that leakage is a serious issue for the validity of ML-based science. The second is to emphasize that if you build, use, or use, or come across uh, ML models in your own work, um, you should closely investigate them for leakage before accepting any scientific claims that are made on their basis. And the third is to outline one potential way to detect and prevent leakage in your as well as your community's work. So with all that said, said uh, here's a rough outline of the talk today. It will be in three approximately equal uh, length parts. The first is leakage in ML-based science, and then we'll move on to the next. Um, all right, so let's jump in. So I have two goals for the first part of the talk and two key findings to share. Uh, the first is to show that leakage is widespread in ML-based science. And the second is perhaps counterintuitively that fixing leakage is not so simple. So we've talked quite a bit about leakage, but what is data leakage? Um, so data leakage is a spurious relationship between the independent variables or the features 
and the target variables or the outcomes in a machine learning model. It can arise during any stage of the modeling process, during data collection, sampling, pre-processing, or when you're evaluating. Perhaps most importantly, since this relationship is not present in the distribution of interest, it usually leads to inflated estimates of performance. So in other words, developers will always overestimate how well they can do when their models suffer from data leakage. Now, this definition can be quite a mouthful. Um, so let's begin with a few examples. Perhaps the simplest example of leakage is when there is no training and test site split uh, when you're evaluating the model. Uh, so in machine learning models, uh, splitting the data set into a training set, which you train your machine learning model on, an evaluation set, which you test it on, uh, is, is one of the most fundamental aspects of it. And not splitting the data set like, like this is a textbook, exa textbook example of overfitting. That is, your model's estimates will be over-optimistic. So it might seem like such a simple example of overfitting would be um, perhaps pretty rare in published research. But in fact, we found that it is still surprisingly prevalent. So here's a paper from 2020, which looked at uh, neuropsychology and uh, tried to see what is the state of using machine learning methods in this field. Out of the 100 studies that they assessed, 45 of them did not have a trained test split. So here's one example of such a simple error creeping in into a large number of scientific studies that use machine learning. A second type of data leakage occurs when we use illegitimate features for the task at hand. Uh, so here's one example on the slide. Consider that a hospital is trying to create a machine learning model to answer this question. Will a hospital patient get hypertension? Um, and the data used in the model can be things like past health ailments, patient age, and even if the doctor has ordered hypertension medicine. Now, some of you might already recognize that the use of the second feature that is the doctor ordering hypertension medicine for a patient is a giveaway. Um, in other words, if a doctor has already ordered hypertension medicine for a patient, then perhaps the outputs of this model have no clinical utility because this is not the kind of patient for whom this, mo this model will be useful eventually. Now, again, this might seem like a simple error, but here's an example of a study which actually did commit this fallacy. Um, so in one of, one of the studies published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research, models used for predicting the onset of hypertension actually used antihypertensive drugs as a feature. Now, you might be thinking that, you know, this is a trivial error, or perhaps this was the developer's fault, but modern machine learning datasets often have thousands of features. And so in these cases, it's really hard to zone into which ones of these features are legitimate for use and which ones are not. And especially if the developers were not too concerned about leakage when they were building these models, it's really, really hard to come up with a justification for removing these features. All right, uh, here's the third and final example of leakage. Uh, the third example is when a model trained on one population. So for instance, if we're training a model on all the books which have been written in English, is then used to make some inference about another type of population perhaps books written in all languages. So this is an instance of sampling bias because the model has been trained on only on information in like a particular subset of the data, but that subset does not actually reflect the terrain where the model will be deployed. So one of my favorite examples of this error is when models used for co diagnosing COVID-19 were actually diagnosing whether someone is a child or an adult because all the images of chest x-rays of people with COVID um, came from adults. And all of the people, or all of the images of chest x-rays of people without COVID came from children. So once we'd identified uh, that data leakage is pretty common in ML-based science, we wanted to see how common. So we wanted to understand if this is a problem in uh, just these three papers or in a bunch of papers that we mentioned, or if this is more widespread. And so we conducted a survey on finding papers which have reported data leakage in their own fields. Our main finding from this study was that leakage is widespread in ML-based science. We found 329 papers that were affected across 17 different fields and found that leakage was a cause of reproducibility failures in each case. But perhaps more worryingly, 
each of these fields was independently rediscovering these issues. And part of it was because different fields had different terminologies for the same errors. So some fields call this validity shrinkage, some others call this confounding, um, and like some others call it leakage as well. So once we figured out that leakage is such a huge problem in ML-based science, we wanted to figure out why. And here's the hypothesis that we came up with. Um, traditionally, machine learning has been a community which has very much been focused on engineering applications. Uh, you can think of these as uh, applications like the one Dr. Mitchell just described, or ones which are deployed in the industry, in perhaps a big tech company, and so on. Um, in, in these applications, the machine learning process goes as follows. So you have the build phase, where you're building the machine learning model. You have the validation phase, where you see if the model is any good on data that it hasn't seen before. And then you have the deployment phase, where the model is actually deployed into the real world, so you can get feedback from users. And this is the crucial part that we do not have access to in ML-based science. When we have errors or when we have reports of errors from users, we can go back to the drawing board, try to fix our model for these errors, and re-release it in a way that addresses these issues. So in other words, uh, these errors can be fixed quickly. And especially if we are doing pilot studies before we release the models, there are low stakes for small errors. And perhaps uh, like the, the final point here is absolute performance numbers in engineering applications are not so important. Um, and, and we'll see why in a minute. So compared to engineering applications in ML-based science, we still have the build phase where we're building the ML model. We still have the validation phase where we're trying to see if the model does any, like performs well on, on our data set. But crucially, the third step of this uh, process is publishing a paper based on this study. And so we see that there is no mechanism once a paper is published to correct errors that have already been published. In fact, we ourselves, when we pointed out reproducibility failures in the past, have faced a lot of pushback from the original authors. So as you can see, like errors take a long time to uncover and challenge in ML-based science. And Perhaps in, in ML-based science, there is, the stakes are much higher because once you have a published paper on a certain problem uh, that almost becomes like written in stone, there are really high stakes and uh, it can create a false scientific consensus in entire communities, as we'll see later on in the slide. And perhaps most importantly, the absolute performance numbers in ML-based science are, can be quite important. So for instance, if we are publishing a scientific study and based on the study, we need regulatory approval, we really do care about how precisely how well a machine learning model can perform. Whereas in engineering applications, what we often care about more is the relative ordering of different kinds of models. So we do have to, in some cases, like engineers have to deploy a model in a production setting. And all they care about is which of the two models performs better, rather than caring about what the precise accuracy numbers for each of these are. So for all of these reasons, um, we hypothesize that leakage is extremely rampant in ML-based science, much more so than uh, it affects engineering applications. So here's a personal anecdote, which also reflects this a little bit. Um, before starting my PhD, I used to work as a software engineer at Facebook. And when people released ML models, it was clear that most people building ML models knew that leakage could be an issue with their models. But even so, they did not get too much about it because it was clear that even if a model with leakage perhaps goes into production, you could quickly roll out a fix, um, especially if you're working in a low stakes setting. In other words, Facebook allowed you to move fast and break things. And though it did not always work out very well for them, um, for fixing leakage, it was quite enough. In contrast, ML-based science has no production setting at all. And as we discussed, there is no mechanism for fixing these errors once the model has been released. Now, perhaps counterintuitively, I want to share one reason why fixing leakage is not as easy as you might think. Um, so there's an apocryphal story of the US Army AI tank classifier, which was supposed to distinguish between U US and Soviet tanks. And once like researchers built the model, they found that it did so with exceptional accuracy. But it turned out when people uh, dug into the data that all the examples of Soviet tanks were on a bright sunny day and all examples of US tanks were on a cloudy day. 
So much like the dog versus wolf example, it turns out that this model was great at classifying weather, but not so great at classifying tank country. Now you can imagine any number of spurious correlations between what you actually care about in this case, which country the tank is from, and perhaps things that are not really of interest. So you can imagine things like the background changing, the types of trees and foliage in the background, types of electricity wires, and so on. So this points to the fact that even if we are aware of leakage in this case, we cannot easily fix it. So perhaps in this case, you would want all the images of tanks to be on, say, a common battlefield or something like that, which is a non-trivial fix to implement. It is not just about fixing the ML model. It's about fixing the data that the model relies on. All right, so this brings us to the end of the first part of the talk, where we found that leakage is widespread in ML-based science. In fact, almost every field that is adopting ML methods has suffered from it. And that fixing leakage is not as easy as it might seem at first glance. So this brings us to the second part of the talk, which is detecting leakage using model info sheets. Now, once again, there are two key findings from this part. The first insight is that all examples of leakage that we found belong to one of just eight categories. And we can use this to create a taxonomy of the different kinds of leakage in ML-based science. And the second is that while there are no perfect solutions for fixing leakage, we can use this taxonomy to detect and perhaps prevent leakage in ML-based science. So when we uh, carried out a survey, the long table that we showed earlier on, we quickly found that there were three main categories of leakage. Each of the cases of leakage that we found could be classified into these three categories over and over again. The first was when there is no clean separation between the training and the test sets. The second was the use of illegitimate features. And the third was when the test set, that is the data set that you're using to evaluate your model is not drawn from the distribution that you actually care about. And further, when we looked a bit deeper into this, we found that these three main categories could be divided into eight subcategories. Now, I won't have time to go over all eight of these. Um, our paper has details on all eight and lots of examples from each, but I will go one of these categories, or sorry, one example from each of the three main categories. So here's an example from the Allegheny family screening tool. So the Allegheny family screening tool is a predictive model that was de deployed in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania to predict which children are at risk of maltreatment. And based on this model, the state decided which families should be investigated and which children should be separated from the parents. Now you can imagine that this is an extremely high stakes setting. Um, based on the outputs of this model, children could literally be separated from their families. Still, uh, it suffered from two of the fundamental kinds of leakage that we found. I'll talk about one of them here. So the, the initial version of the model, which was deployed for two years from 2016 to 2018, the training and test set split was carried out only after the features for the model had already been selected. So in other words, the model uh, building team was selecting features on the entire data set, and that included the test set. This meant that when they evaluated the models, the model performed much better than uh, it, it actually did if, a, if they used a separate uh, held out test set. The second example uh, is the feature that we use for predicting the output is actually a proxy for the output variable. So we saw one example of this earlier uh, in, in the talk where we saw hypertension prediction models using antihypertensive drugs as a feature. Here's another uh, example which had vast real world impact. So Epic is the largest US health tech company. It has data on over 250 million people and in 2016, they released a model which used all of this data to predict which hospital patients will have sepsis. Five years later, in 2021, there was an independent validation study which found that the model performed much worse than the developers had claimed. And in fact, just earlier uh, in October, 2022, Epic stopped selling this model with uh, citing similar concerns. So the model had many issues, but one of them was that in order to predict who will get sepsis, the model was using features which said that the, the doctor had ordered antibiotics for a patient. But relying on antibiotics as one of the features in the model means that 
it is already, uh, sepsis had already been detected in those cases. But the model still counted these uh, cases as successes for it. And so you can imagine it led to vastly over-optimistic numbers because anything that the clinician had already detected was also counted as a success. The third example is sampling bias, which is when the type of distribution that you want to uh, use your model in differs from the type of distribution that it is trained on. So here you can see one example of this. Um, the example is when an ML model was used to predict which patients in a hospital uh, had suffered from a disease based on chest x-rays. Instead of detecting any actual symptoms of the disease, it detected the hospital tokens on the right-hand side. And based on how frequent diseases were in given hospitals, uh, it tried to classify which patients should be predicted as healthy or unhealthy. Now you can imagine that such a model has no clinical utility at all, because all it is doing is predicting which hospital an image comes from. Um, and, and because the distribution that you want to deploy it on is probably from a very different kind of hospital, this image classification system is completely useless. So coming back to our survey, um, we found that each of these cases suffered from at least one of the types of leakage that we described. Perhaps more surprisingly, in many fields, people's uh, like research suffered from multiple different kinds of issues. Um, so you can see in the bottom row, for instance, it suffered from six out of the eight kinds of leakage that we have identified. The other thing to note in our taxon taxonomy is that not all leakage is created equal. So some examples of leakage that we saw, for instance, not using a separate train and test set, are textbook examples of overfitting. But some other examples, like the last example we saw with the chest x-rays, uh, occur because of a distribution shift between the test set and the scientific claim that we are making. So while the former is this textbook example, the latter is still an open research problem, which is how to account for distribution shifts between the test set and the scientific claim of interest. So what I want to stress is that while fixing leakage is a long-term research goal, in the meantime, we need to do our best to prevent leakage in existing literature. Uh, so here's our proposal for doing that. Um, when we realized that all the examples of leakage that we'd seen stem from only eight types of leakage, we tried to think about what mechanisms we have for authors and reviewers of scientific research um, to catch these types of leakage before they enter published research. So along with our paper, we also introduce model info sheets that are inspired by Dr. Mitchell's work on model cards for model reporting. They're also inspired by this tradition of using checklists to, use the, to improve the quality of healthcare research. So in particular, the Equator Network has over 500 checklists for different kinds of medical research. So the way model info sheets work is that they have a set of about 20 questions and answering those questions would uh, enable the detection of each type of leakage that we identified. So in particular, like each of the three main categories, the train and test split is maintained during each step of the modeling process. Each of the features used in the model is legitimate for the task at hand and that the distribution of the scientific interest is, matches the test set that you have. The reason we focused on model info sheets was that in most cases where leakage was found, reading a paper alone was not enough to allow the detection of leakage. In fact, there was a wide gap between the information that was available from reading the paper and the information found by reading the code. Now we'll see in the later part of this talk that one of the papers where we found issues had over 10,000 lines of code and the error was in one function call. So you can imagine how small these errors can be. So model info sheets provide somewhat of a middle ground. Um, you can provide more information about the models that you build, which would uh, allow the detection of leakage without having reviewers dive into the code. So the template for model info sheets can be found at, on this website, reproducible.cs.princeton.edu. And I hope that people adopting ML methods in the audience will give it a shot. And if you have any feedback, please do let us know. So this brings me to the end of the second part of the talk, where the two key insights were that all types of leakage that we found in our survey belong to one of just eight categories, which we can then use to create a taxonomy of leakage. And the second was that while there are no perfect solutions for fixing leakage, 
we can use this taxonomy to detect leakage in ML-based science. All right. Uh, so we're in the third part uh, and final part of our talk now, where again, I have two key findings to share. The first is that all papers on civil war prediction, which is a subfield of political science, that compare machine learning models to older statistical methods such as logistic regression, fail to reproduce because of leakage. And when the errors are corrected, ML methods perform no better than logistic regression across the board. The second key finding is that lack of significance testing and uncertainty evaluation when comparing the performance of ML models is really common. But perhaps ironically, any results without these two steps cannot be trusted in the absence. So let's begin by looking at what can civil war prediction teach us about ML-based science. So there are three key things that I want to emphasize by this case study. First is that leakage is not a hypothetical or insignificant concern. That is, an ML model having leakage can substantively change the results from a scientific study. The second is that leakage can lead to widely held incorrect beliefs in an entire discipline. And the third is that model info sheets which we just introduced can help uh, reduce or perhaps prevent leakage in published studies. All right, so this is the slide which presents our main results. It's a bit dense, so I'll go over it for a minute. The slide has four columns. Each of these columns represents one peer reviewed paper in political science, which compares machine learning models to logistic regression models. Each column has uh, two dots are up right above it, like on the top of the slide. And those represent the performance numbers on the left-hand side that were reported in the paper, and on the right-hand side that we found after we corrected the uh, leakage. So our key finding is that in all four papers, when the errors were corrected, ML mod models performed no better than decades old logistic regression models. But here's the kicker. This entire field had perhaps incorrectly assumed that civil war prediction is a data problem that is very well suited to machine learning methods because ML methods were claimed to perform like vastly better than older methods such as logistic regression. But this entire scientific consensus was false because once you correct this leakage, uh, the, this, the gap between the performance of ML models and logistic regression models disappears completely. And as I mentioned, in this case, we also see that model info sheets can enable the detection of leakage in each case. So uh, one of these papers had over 1,000 lines of code. And as I mentioned, the error was in one function call. And it took us weeks of work to find out why ML models had such high performance numbers and what we can sort of learn from it. So when we initially started working on this project, our intention was not to investigate reproducibility at all. In fact, what we wanted to find out was what enables machine learning models to perform so well? And how can we translate these successes into other fields? What we instead found that was that the entire field suffered from reproducibility issues, which make any scientific claims in this field invalid. Um, and, and so, yeah, so it took us weeks of work uh, to find out why ML models were performing like so much better and what we could do to sort of fix these issues. But model info sheets, which would have enabled the detection of leakage in each of these cases. The second key finding that I wanted to talk to you about was the lack of significance testing and uncertainty quantification. Uh, so as you can see in this table in the first three columns, most of the papers that we saw did not provide any confidence intervals, nor did they test for statistical significance when comparing the performance of ML models with older statistical methods. But in the uh, like middle column, you, you, you can see that the number of rows in the test set, as well as the number of positive test set instances are usually very small. In fact, in some cases, they're as small as like tens of samples. When we have such few number of samples, providing measures of uncertainty becomes even more important. So why do these papers not report these things? And why isn't it the norm to report uh, uncertainty evaluations and significance testing numbers along with ML models. So once again, we think that this is due to the difference between the engineering settings in which ML, -based, uh, ML models have been developed and the scientific research setting where ML-based models are now being used. 
engineering applications are insulated against the worst effects of not performing uh, uncertainty quantification and significance testing because most ML research is in the domain of extremely large data sets. Um, on top of that, a lot of these fields have benchmark data sets, which mean that every scientific paper or a lot of scientific papers compare their performance on the same exact data to see how well they perform. And third, as we saw before, the engineering setting has built-in mechanisms to detect when something goes wrong in the form of feedback from users or in the form of bug reports and so on. But ML-based science has none of these safeguards. We have small data. We often do not use benchmark data sets and feedback mechanisms are extremely costly and time intensive. So this is why we think that uh, when, while ML-based science is adopting the same tools and methods that are used in uh, like ML methods research or engineering applications, the ML community needs to pay strong, sorry, the ML-based science community needs to pay a lot of attention on these issues because the ML community has never really solved these problems. Uh, the ML community never really had to worry about the domain of small data sets or the domain of uh, like domains outside benchmark data, but those are precisely the domains in which we operate. So this brings me to the end of the third part of the talk where we saw two key findings again. The first was that all papers on civil war prediction that compare ML models to logistic regression fail to reproduce due to data leakage. When the errors are corrected, these models perform no better than logistic regression across the board. And the second key finding was that the lack of significance testing and uncertainty evaluation, while it is okay for the ML methods community or the engineering community, for ML-based science, these results cannot be trusted in their absence. All right, so what are the takeaways for the audience from this entire presentation? So from the first part of the talk, we have two main things. The first is do not trust absolute performance numbers for ML models unless they have been externally validated. It's extremely easy to commit failures of leakage or external validity checks. Um, and in the absence of independent verification, these absolute performance numbers are relatively meaningless. The second is to not take general claims about the performance of ML models based on specific data sets. Um, so for instance, an example of this is when computer vision researchers claim that machine learning models have reached human levels of uh, object detection or something like that. But these claims only hold for the specific data set on which these models are trained. And in fact, even if the distribution of data changes very slightly, these claims can fall short. From the second part of the talk, we saw that fixing leakage is much more difficult than detecting leakage. And while it is difficult to detect leakage by just reading a scientific paper, model info sheets provide a middle ground between reading the paper and reading the code, and it can make the detection of leakage much easier. Finally, from the last part of the talk, uh, the two key takeaways are first, don't take claims of the superiority of ML models compared to simple baselines at face value. And this is especially true when the issue at stake is things like social outcomes, such as civil war prediction, or uh, predicting who will perform well at a job and so on. The second is that significance testing and uncertainty quantification are both extremely important to compare the performance of ML models, especially when we are in the domain of low amounts of data and no benchmark data sets. All right, so I'll leave you with these uh, seven key takeaways on the slide. Uh, I'm also currently working on a book with Professor Arvind Narayanan. So, we focus there on what AI perhaps cannot do well. Uh, we call it, we are calling it AI snake oil. And uh, here's a link at the bottom for a blog where we keep posting updates on our thoughts. Thank you so much.